Hello, welcome to me and me again. Yes. Woo! In this video, we're going to describe what happens after a magma is formed. This table shows you the different types of magma and their chemical composition, temperature, viscosity, and gas contents. And if you remember, this four affects the formation of magma. And each type of magma has different temperature, viscosity, and gas content. Okay? As you can see, rhyolitic type of magma has the highest viscosity and gas content. We also discussed the processes for magma generation and where it is generated. Increase in temperature is in hot spots. Decrease in pressure is commonly found at spreading margins. And addition of volatiles commonly occurs at subduction zone. Okay, so what happens to magma after it is formed? Mm. Imagine a water container and you have a rock and a styrofoam. Then you decided to throw them both in the water. So as you can see, the rock stays in the bottom and the styrofoam floats. It's because the styrofoam is denser than the rock. This is the same with magma. It's because of the density contrast. Okay, so magma is less dense than the surrounding country rock. And they rises faster when the difference in density between the magma and the surrounding rock is greater. Remember, at deeper levels, magma passes through the grain and cracks of the surrounding rock. So when the magma has enough mass and buoyancy, buoyancy is the power to float, then it pushes the surrounding rock to the side as it rises. Depending on the surrounding pressure and other factors, the magma can be ejected or rise at shallower levels underneath. This figure shows two processes as magma rises. First, it's the ejection. They are ejected out to the surface through volcanoes. The second one is the solidification within shallower levels. So they form intrusive igneous rocks. Okay, if you remember. I do not. I've heard of it though. <laughs> At shallow levels, magma may no longer rise because its density is almost the same as that of the country rock. So they are at equilibrium. Here, the magma starts to accumulate and slowly solidifies. So it will not go out, okay? Now, another factor that affects is the viscosity. So viscosity is the measure of a fluid's resistance to flow. Magmas with low viscosity flow more easily than those with high viscosity. Temperature, silica content, and volatile content control the viscosity of the magma. This table shows the relationship between these factors and the viscosity. Okay? Now, mafic magma is less viscous than silicic magma because it's hotter and contains less silica. So as you can see, the higher the temperature, the lower viscosity it is. And since it contains less silica, the viscosity also decreases. So remember, temperature and viscosity inverse relationship. Silica content and viscosity have direct relationship. Okay. Also, the volatiles in magma decreases viscosity. So when there are more volatile substances in the magma, the viscosity decreases. Okay. I know that you have seen this figure, right? Or the diagram in one of the previous videos. So this is the Bowen's reaction series. So Norman L. Bowen explained why certain minerals tend to occur together while others are almost never associated with one another. So in the early 1900s, he heated powdered rock mineral until it melted. He allowed the molten material to cool down and observed the minerals that formed in the rocks. He repeated this process with progressively lower temperatures and the results he got led him to now call the Bowen's reaction series. Up to this day, this series is still accepted as the idealized progression of minerals produced by cooling magma. So based on this, 
one can infer from minerals present in a rock condition under which the rock had formed. I don't understand. I don't understand, bitch. I don't understand. I don't understand, bitch. This series show that certain minerals are stable at higher melting temperature and they crystallize before those stable at lower temperatures. This series also explain how minerals are formed under different temperature conditions. Now this series has two branches, okay? The continuous branch and the discontinuous branch. You have to remember that these branches happen simultaneously. Now let's talk about the discontinuous branch. So the discontinuous branch describes how ferromagnesian minerals in the magma are transformed as temperature changes. So remember that ferromagnesian minerals are silicate minerals in which cations of iron and magnesium form essential components. Okay, actually it's a collective term used to cover such minerals as the olivines, pyroxenes, biotite, and etc. So the early formed crystal olivine in this case reacts with the remaining melt as the magma cools down and recrystallizes into pyroxene. So this is the olivine and it will become pyroxene. So further cooling will transform pyroxene to amphiboly. So if all iron and magnesium in the melt is used up before all the pyroxene recrystallizes, then the ferromagnesian minerals in the solid rock would be amphiboly and pyroxene and they will not contain olivine and biotite. So as you can see, iron and magnesium here play important roles. <laughs> so what are the important things or concepts that we can use from the Bowen's reaction series aside from it's very hard? It's very true. First, is a mafic magma will crystallize into pyroxene and calcium-rich plagioclase if and only if the early formed crystals are not removed from the remaining magma. So similarly, an intermediate magma will crystallize into diorite and or andesite if early formed minerals are not removed. Next, if minerals are separated from magma, the remaining magma is more silicic than the other original magma. So for example, if olivine and calcium-rich plagioclase are removed, the residual melt would be richer in silicon and sodium and poorer in iron and magnesium. Third is when rocks are heated in high temperatures, minerals will melt in reverse order. Remember that. Okay. If the temperature is raised further, biotite and sodium-rich plagioclase would contribute to the melt. Again, any minerals higher in the series would remain solid unless the temperature is raised further. So what do you mean by reverse order? It's going up the series in the Bowen's reaction series diagram. So meaning quartz and potassium feldspar would melt first. The processes by which the composition of magma change is what we call magmatic differentiation. So again, it's the process of creating one or more secondary magmas from single parent magma. And we have a lot of types. What? That is shocking. So we have crystal fractionation, partial mixing, magma mixing, assimilation, filter pressing, inward crystallization, and flow segregation. But we're only going to focus to this four bold words. Wow, that was so powerful. <laughs> Ready? Let's go. First, we have crystal fractionation. Crystal fractionation, just remember, it's a chemical process by which the composition of a liquid changes due to crystallization. So crystallization, liquid to solid, simple. Common mechanism for crystal fractionation is crystal settling which you're familiar with, right? No, spoil, no! We kind of discussed this in one of the videos. So this means that the denser materials crystallize first and settle down, while lighter materials crystallize at the latter stages. And remember that in the Bowen's reaction series, What was that? Denser minerals 
form first, leaving the magma more silicic. Another is the partial melting. So as described in the series, quartz and muscovite are basically the most stable minerals, making them the first one to melt from the parent rock. So as you can see here in the graph, so as the silica content decreases, the more the magma is melted. Partial melting of ultramafic rock in the mantle produces a basaltic magma. Remember, ultramafic rocks are igneous and meta-igneous rocks with a very low silica content. Next, we have magma mixing. So it occurs when two different magma rises with the more buoyant mass overtakes the more slowly rising magma. So this is clearly shown here in the figure. As you can see, the magma is less dense than the host rock and therefore buoyant. There's convective flow, then the magma mixes generating a single intermediate magma. Next, we have assimilation and contamination of magma by crustal rocks. This is a reaction that occurs when the crust is mixed up with the rising magma. So as magma rises to the surface, the surrounding rocks which it meets may get dissolved. It's because of the heat. Then when they dissolve, they will get mixed to the magma. So basically in biology, this is the absorption and digestion of food or nutrients by the body or any biological system. Assimilation is that process of magmatic differentiation whereby ascending magmas evolve chemically by recruiting easily melted or dissolved components. So as you can see, as magma rises, the heat transfers to the surrounding walls, then rocks will fall, then they will quote unquote contaminate it. So this is the end of our video. Thanks everybody for coming out. I know y'all didn't expect me. Thank y'all so much, especially you in the back right now.